Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and on today's episode, we're, uh, it's the second part of our financial caregiving series, and today's episode, we're going to be talking to adult children and what do they need to know. So this is more from the perspective of an, um, an older adult with an adult child who isn't having a memory problem or is maybe pretty early um, in, that, in that process. So welcome, Cameron. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. So before we get started, uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am a financial journalist. I am the author of Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk, How to Have Essential Conversations with Your Parents About Their Finances. I was a caregiver for more than 12 years for my mom who had Alzheimer's. I'm also the uh, director of education and content at a company called Careful, which is a digital platform that was built to protect aging adults' daily finances. And that's spelled C-A-R-E-F-U-L-L. Yes. And it is an app, so that way people can can find that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, from the perspective of if you're an older adult and you're wanting to take the initiative, um, in the first episode we talked about you know, a child having to take the initiative. So if you're an older adult, um, you know, when should you have this conversation with your adult children? I think the best time to have this conversation is when you are healthy and relatively young. Having this conversation in your 50s with your 20-something or early 30-something children is a great idea. I know it can feel awkward to have this conversation. Why do your kids need to know details about your finances well because there's a good chance they're going to have to get involved in your financial lives at some point more than half of adults once they reach age 65 will need some sort of long-term care at some point in the rest of their lives and so there's a good chance that you're going to need long-term care and that might mean that your children are have to going to get involved and help manage your finances and provide that care for you even if you do not need long-term care, all of us as part of the aging process will experience a decline in our financial decision-making ability and an ability to manage our finances if we live long enough. It, it just well, happens. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just beg to differ because that's actually not a normal part of aging, but it is super common. So decline aging doesn't equal decline, doesn't equal necessarily mean decreased capacity, but we live in a culture with a lot of chronic illnesses. And so it is very common. And so I just wanted to correct the the common belief that aging equals decline. But I And I but would I do not think... necessarily say decline, but like our ability to manage our finances because it can there's a lot that you have to juggle when you manage your finances. And so, you know, just as as we age, sometimes some of those tasks can be harder to handle, even if we're not experiencing like a, you know, if, even if there's not dementia, sometimes staying on top of all those tasks that are required to manage our finances can be difficult for some of us. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I guess if you're like 90, 95 yes. and you're more frail, but that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, most people aren't um, living in most older adults aren't living in a nursing home they're living in the community they're managing their own business but I do think that a good time when we're talking about when to have the conversation is when you're updating kind of your legal paperwork and or you're naming someone to be your executor you know that that person needs to know yes. and so like I have I have the case like where my parents have said you know you and your brother are in charge. And then I have a friend who's like, you know, you're going to be the executor of my estate and like has sent me the paperwork, but I'm like, but I don't like live with you. I don't know what, I don't know what any of your financial stuff looks like, you know? And so to me, if you, that's, that's a good time. You know, if you're the, you know, the, the older adult and this, you know, so these conversations are happening in their fifties. Um, and when sure. I make my son, my executor, um, so uh, what information do you share? Like, like I basically get was sent the pa the paperwork that says you're the power of attorney. You're the, you're all this stuff. You're going to be the executor. And I'm like, is that all you get? Like, what else should I be asking <laughs> for? <laughs> well, really you, 
it's as the parent, it is up to you to decide how much information you share and which children you share it with. I think all of your children should have a general idea about your financial situation and they all need to know, do you have those essential estate planning documents, a will or a trust, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, a living will, and they need to know where those documents are. But if you have named one of your children, your power of attorney, meaning that they have the right to make financial decisions and transactions for you once you're no longer able to, that person needs to have a good idea about the details of your finances because let's say you do have a stroke. So your child needs to know, well, where do you bank? The child needs to be able to access that bank account to pay the bills for you. That child needs to know what ways you have to pay for care if you need long-term care. You know, the child needs to know, you know is there still a mortgage? Is there, are there other types of debt? I mean, really that child, if that child is going to be managing your finances for you at some point, that child needs to know everything. And the child who- Including is, not only account numbers, but passwords. Oh yes. Usernames, passwords, they need it all, which seems like a lot of information to provide your child while you're still- healthy and able to manage your finances on your own. And so you don't have to give them all this information now, but you should write it down and tell them how to access it and where it is and under what circumstances they can access that list of information about your accounts. If your child has been named your executor. (laughs) So this is where I give the plug for your amazing in case of emergency organizer. And I will link it into the description of this episode. It'll be on my website. Um, but it is probably one of the most thorough documents for doing exactly what you're saying. Like just to say, okay, if I'm your executor, here's your, in case of emergency organizer, I need you to fill this out and keep it updated you know, and maybe remind them annually because you know, usernames and passwords change, but keep it with all those legal documents because, you know, what you, what your book describes and what I know is, you know, it's called forensic financial caregiving, where you have to figure all this stuff out. So talk about that process. If, if someone doesn't get, you know, if they don't write down all their usernames and passwords, because you think about it, like we have pretty complex financial lives. I mean, you know, between like Netflix, like all the stuff it would take, like if you were to pass away, like how many accounts do you actually have? And I didn't think I had that many, but I'm like, well, we've got Verizon. We've got the, the Verizon phone and the TV. We've got you know, Netflix and Disney plus and like, it's all those little things, you know, a a Best Buy card, you know, that you maybe use or don't use. So um, talk a little bit about kind of what information you need to gather and how to share that. So as you mentioned, I did create in a case of emergency organizer that asked for all of that information, including you know, social security card, Medicare number, health insurance policy number, if you still have a health insurance policy, life insurance, you know, all those, like, all your financial accounts, the usernames, the passwords, Stocks, medicals, bonds, all of it. Yes, because the thing is, even if your kids don't get involved in your financial life when you're living, when you pass away, someone is going to have to deal with that. And if you're married, that might be your spouse, but your spouse needs that information because your spouse is going to need to be able to access accounts. Your spouse, if you have life insurance, still is gonna need to know where that policy is to call the life insurer to say, hey, I need to claim those death benefits now to pay for the funeral and to help have money to support myself. And so all that information needs to be available for the people who are left behind because they are going to be grieving. And if they have to play detective, to figure out what accounts need to be closed, what assets were left behind. That's an absolute nightmare. When my mother passed away a year ago, I knew everything about her finances because I had been managing them for years, but it was still a lot of work dealing with what was left behind. If I had to go snooping and and try to piece together her financial picture, That would have made things a lot more difficult at an already difficult time for me. And so think of it as a gift to the people you are leaving behind is to have all of this information 
organized for them so that they don't have to play detective and so that it won't be even more difficult for them. And the thing is too, you've worked hard to build your savings to, you know, to, and you don't want accounts to just be turned over to the state as an unclaimed asset because no one even knew it existed. And that happens because it almost happened with my mother when she had was living and had Alzheimer's disease and I didn't have all the details about her finances and there was an account that I didn't even know existed. And so if you if you give your kids this information, then you don't have to worry about accounts <laughs> disappearing and being turned over to the state and people not being able to find them. And so really it is a gift to your heirs and to your children. Right. And it actually just makes me think that this is, you know, this is something people should do at least by age 18, 25. Cause I'm just thinking to myself now, I was like, you know, I probably should, I've got two adult children, one's still a minor, you know, but my youngest child, you know, his dad passed away when he was six years old and his, you know, we weren't married at the time. So his mom had to go through and do all of these things. And, you know, I can't imagine how hard that would be to do even for a child. So I think that a lot of what we're talking about today isn't just between an older adult and a child. Well, it's any parent, any child, but also, you know, so it's a gift that you give each other. But again, you know, even annually updating that kind of in case of emergency organizer, it's not something you need to share each year. You know, it's just kind of like make sure, like just let people know where it is and how to access it because it is a, it is a huge gift. Um, Cause I was just thinking now, you know, with my older two, I'm like, I probably should like maybe for Christmas, this is what I'll do. I'll put it in a little envelope and say, <laughs> please, you know, and, and take them to an attorney. I mean, it's not like they're older, you know, that they can really afford to have, some of their own paperwork done, but they need to be making these decisions too, you know? Um, really? Yes. Because once your kids turn 18, you know, you, they're adults and, you know, something happens to them. You need to be named their healthcare power of attorney so that you can make medical decisions for them. If they can't, you need to be named or, their or they, or they attorney. need to, or they need to have the choice. Like who, maybe they, maybe he would prefer right. Her, you know, maybe they would rather a sibling do right. that, you know, and then, you know, making sure that gets updated with every major life event. But to, I think yes. it helps to, because I was just thinking this would be a good thing to, it would be a, a teaching lesson for them, but it also starts these conversations within my own family a little earlier. You know, basically my parents have always just said to me, they're like, well, if something happens to me, call this lawyer. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and luckily I've not ever had to to do that, but uh, but it it is interesting. So um, let's talk a little bit um, more within this series about you know how do you create and coordinate your circle. So I think it's really and what does that mean? Sure, it's really important to identify those people you trust, who you can envision getting involved with your finances as you age, if you need help. And it's important to identify those people while you are still young and healthy. Because- yeah, starting at age 18. Starting at age 18. Yeah. When things are age, age friendly, they're friendly for everyone. So yes. yes. And the thing is, I know a lot of times people are reluctant to, for example, name a financial power of attorney because they're thinking, well, if I name someone my power of attorney, then they have the power to access my bank accounts and I'm fine. I don't need anyone making financial decisions for me right away. Well, that power of attorney document needs to be a general durable power of attorney, meaning that it's going to take effect immediately. Durable means it remains in effect if you become mentally incompetent, which that's the type of power of attorney you want because you want someone to be able to manage your finances if you are no longer able to yourself. But here's the thing. If you don't want, let's say you name your son as your power of attorney, and you don't want your son to start acting as your power of attorney now, hang on to the document. He really has no power unless he has that actual document because the bank is not going to just take your son's word for it that you have named him power of attorney and they're not just going to say, here, sure, access your parents' bank account, go for it. Well it's, well, it's actually a legal process. I mean, you have to evoke the power of attorney. Like you can't just wake up one day and go, hey, 
I've got the power of attorney documents. Like, doesn't a judge have to like? No, no, a judge does not have to do anything. It depends. If it is a springing power of attorney, then there's language in that document that says this power of attorney will go into effect if, for example, and you can spell it out, I have been diagnosed with dementia and you have to get, you can name, like, I want two doctors, you know, to provide a written diagnosis. Okay. And so then that, yes, but most estate planning attorneys will say, you don't want that sort of power of attorney because it makes it more difficult for your agent to step in and get involved. And so really what you can do is, um, because when my mother, after she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, we went to the bank together to let them know that I was her power of attorney because I was having to get involved. But with some of her other financial institutions, I simply called them up and said, you know, hey, my mother has Alzheimer's disease. I am now acting as her power of attorney. Um, do you want, you know, I'm gonna send you a copy of the document um, do you, does it need that copy? Does it need to be notarized? Are there additional forms that I need to fill out? The financial institution is going to walk you through the process. Um, but no, you don't necessarily have to get a judge involved. But so if you are the adult and you are drafting that document, which I have already named my stepbrother as my power of attorney, in addition to my husband, um, you just hang on to the document and you say, look, if I am diagnosed with a disease, and I am you know, no longer able to manage my finances on my own. If I have a stroke, if I've been in an accident, here's where that document is. You can go get that document and then go to the bank and tell the bank, my dad named me power of attorney yeah. and I need to start acting as his agent. So but that's true a to way for you remember to, to Yeah, I was gonna say, and be sure that you tell that se person who's second in line the same information because I just had this thought of like, okay, so what if you and your husband went on a trip I mean, these things happen and both of you end up, you know, in a major accident and pass away, like, you know, who would know who, who's second in line is. So actually I think anybody named in any of your documents, cause I have like the higher, like an mm -hmm. order that, that they'll go down. So, and in our next um, episode, we are going to talk about um, some of the legal authorizations that you need. So what are some final thoughts about talking to adult children and kind of what they need to know? Certainly. So like we were saying, you know, you identify those trusted family members early on. If you don't have children you trust, identify someone else. Maybe it's a niece or a nephew or a family friend. You've got to have someone you trust who can be there for you in case you do need help with finances as you get older. Um, if you um, have some children you trust and some children you don't trust, then share your financial information with the children you trust. You don't have to have this conversation necessarily with all of your children. Like I mentioned earlier though, you know, it's a good idea if you have a good relationship with all of your children to give them all a general idea of where you stand financially, but the child or children who are gonna be involved as power of attorney, as executor or trustee, they need to have as many details as possible. And you can put those details in writing. And in the in case of emergency organizer. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with me today. Um, this is the end of our second in the financial caregiving series. Um, well, second of, I think four is what we'll do. Um, but we're, this one was about talking to adult children, what they need to know. The first episode that we did um, was around talking to parents and siblings. If you're the older adult, or if you're the child, you need to talk to a parent, um, kind of why, when, and how. And so join us next week um, and we'll move into that. What legal authorizations do you need? And we'll finish this out talking about um, different scams to be aware of. So thank you so much for joining me today, Cameron. Sure. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab, and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.